the entrepreneurial journey podcast we're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make it happen grab your seat let's have a blast at the entrepreneurial journey Hello and welcome to the Entrepreneurial Journey podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have Peter Wood with me. Peter, tell everybody what it is that you currently do. So I'm the CEO of two international fashion brands, Rebecca. One is called All Sense and the other one is John Vervetos. All Sense I didn't know it was two. Yeah, yeah. So All Sense, most people will probably have heard of. Usually when I mention All Sense, people say, ah, the sewing machines, and, and uh, because many of the stores have sewing machines in the window displays. But All Sense is a British okay. brand, founded in 1994. John Vervetos, actually, we took on during lockdown, and it's based in New York. So that was a whole challenge all of itself, um, which we'll maybe talk about too. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Because last time I saw you in London, it was just CEO of All Saints. So that's quite yeah. exciting. We'll come back to that later. Um, so when, when you were a kid in school and somebody said, what do you want to be when you grow up, Peter? You went, I want to be the CEO of two international fashion brands. Is that actually what you wanted to do or was it something else? No, that's that's fair to say that's not what the answer would have been. I'm pretty sure when I was when I was at school and someone <laughs> asked me that, the answer was actually, you know, what I want to be when I grow up is Luke Skywalker uh, from Star Wars because it was the first the first film that I'd seen with my dad. I remember in 1977, giving my age away a little bit because I was four years old, yeah. and uh, you know, I kind of didn't ever imagine until much later in life that I would end up running, you know, fashion brands. But that's how it's that's how it's panned out. And I like to try and tell myself that there are some parallels, <laughs> uh, you know, between running fashion brands and, and you know, um, using the force. But, but you know, maybe that maybe that's just something from my own for my own uh, validation. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be. <laughs> <laughs> so relevant to everyone else listening yeah well it's relevant to me i don't know whether you can see it i've got chewbacca in the background oh my goodness there. yes he's our yeah he's our company mascot um because i like you went to see star wars with my dad in 1977 in the Odeon on Deansgate in Manchester, queued around the block, and my tiny little mind, I was six, a bit older than you, my tiny little mind was blown. <laughs> and, and the force has been with me ever since. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So you grew up in Glasgow. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, thought so. Um. And you trained as an accountant. What led you into accountancy? And then how did you go from being an accountant? Because everybody thinks accountants are really boring into running international fashion brands. Talk us through that. Yeah. So at, at school, I was bright academically. So I was doing, I was doing well at school uh, in, you know, in Glasgow. Um, and but I also loved music. I was in the drama class. I was Bugsy Malone in the school play, um, and and I sort of I played the bagpipes in a pipe band. I learned the piano, so I was very lucky. My parents, you know, tried very hard to let me try as many things as I wanted, you know, as I could to kind of you know uh, grow and develop, I guess, as a child. Um, and I always kind of thought, oh, I want to be an actor, I want to be a musician, I want to be something like that. But then, but then there was this kind of, you know, nervousness around that as a choice in the house. You know, my parents, um, my dad was a policeman, my mum was childminding, she was doing, you know, lots of different jobs. You know, it was it was like a very 
it was a house that didn't have experience of of business or or that whole world of of commerce. So so when I said, "Oh, I quite fancy being an actor," there was a lot of nervousness. Oh, you know, you just need to get a job, son. You know, make sure you get a job. You know, not many actors make it. You know, all that kind of counsel. Uh, and then I didn't really know, and it sounds a bit silly now, but I didn't really know that university was even an option until I was probably about 16 or something like that, literally going into my hires. Because, the, again, there weren't a lot, the, there weren't people in the family around me that had gone to university. There weren't, there weren't actually many people at all from school who had gone to university. But my maths teacher at the time, I kind of saw that that I was good at that subject and and I got you know off I went to university but being from Glasgow and being from quite a cautious household I ended up going to Glasgow University and going home for my tea at night and and um you know but when I was at university I met someone and her dad was a really successful Scottish businessman and I kind of graduated from maths and physics and I kind of moved from thinking I want to be an actor to I want to be a scientist and I want to be a scientist like Richard Feynman or, you know, Einstein or someone that's done something for the world, right? You know, I can still I can still have some sort of impact. But I'd been studying to do a kind of PhD preparation summer scholarship thing and found it incredibly lonely, found it really, really lonely. I was studying maths and physics and and thought, oh my goodness, I don't want to do a PhD. You know, it's going to be three years on my own. I'm not going to enjoy that. Like, you know, and I kind of panicked. And this businessman that I'd met, um, I was talking with him about it. And, and he said, have you ever thought about a business career? And I hadn't, you know, I, I had thought business was, my knowledge of business was there was a TV show called Neighbours where there was a character called Paul Robinson who was like a bad guy. So like business was synonymous yeah. with greed and bad stuff in my head, right? You know, greedy businessmen. Yeah. yeah. And here was this this gentleman, a really successful Scottish businessman, who was just this really wonderful guy doing amazing things for his family, doing amazing things, you know, in his business for his team, his employees, you know, kind of making a difference. And I, th- I thought, oh, wow, this business stuff looks as if it could be quite a positive thing. And he suggested I train yeah. to be a chartered accountant. And and really, I, I know I've kind of dwelled on that a little bit, but if that hadn't happened, that was kind of the beginning of it all to, to kind of open my mind to this kind of world of possibilities. And, and I don't think I would have got there um, without almost like this sort of intervention from, from this guy that I met who was the father of, of, you know, one of my friends from university. Um, and that got me started into accountancy and, and, and you know, onwards from there. That's incredible. So you could have ended up being Professor Brian Cox, a musician and a physicist. <laughs> Instead, you yeah, ended I mean, up being a See, I'm very, I'm very, I think, you know, certainly back then I was very impressionable. So even, even choosing which subjects to study at university, I remember being at a, a boys brigade camp in Ayrshire when I was about 16, I must've been. And, and there was, there was an older guy, you know, they had, you know, sort of young men, 21, 22, that were kind of supervisors. And there was this guy from, from Ayr or Ayrshire looking after us. He was 21. He'd just graduated from Glasgow University. And, and you know, uh, he'd graduated in physics. And he was listening to The Fall and Nick Cave and all these kind of bands. And I thought, oh, this is a cool guy. And and so if he's gone off to Glasgow University to do physics, kind of that's what I'll do, right? So so he was kind of the first step. And what was really what was really nice was, you know, thirty years later, I found we, we literally found each other. I think through LinkedIn, and he's working in Old Street as the COO of some huge energy uh, business. 
and we we met for the first time in like 30 years and I was able to just sort of wow. thank him and say you know if you hadn't if you hadn't inspired me when I was 16 or 17 I wouldn't have done the physics uh, and that was a kind of step one and yeah. then the accountancy was kind of step two and and That's getting amazing. into getting so into ridiculous. yeah yeah well uh, you know it's life is just I don't know it's, it's Certainly, it wasn't planned, right? Those those things were not planned, but 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 I guess when when being open to to seeing what was possible and learning quickly when I got to see what was possible, I suppose those were kind of important factors. And and the fashion piece itself, when I was uh, an accountant in corporate finance with one of the big accountancy firms. I had a client which was a fashion retailer uh, called USC. And um, I remember them. Yeah. And, and they were based, you know, headquartered in Edinburgh, had been doing really well. And I was kind of the junior uh, person in the corporate finance advisory team, helping them raise some private equity to expand. And, um, uh, you know, got to know the founders of that business and I was kind of the whiz kid on the laptop at the time and they needed a CFO and because they were you know really great entrepreneurs they were you know the kind of rules of somebody needs to be a certain age or have a certain amount of experience before they can be your CFO they they didn't sort of think that way and you know I was like 24 or something and and they sat, you know, um, Angus sat me down and said, "Hey, listen, um, you know, we're we're having we're having some challenges at USC right now." And he 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 rattled off a whole list of challenges and problems that the business was facing, uh, and he, he then kind of said, "But apart from that, everything's okay. Would you like to be our CFO?" And 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 he said. We'll give you some. We'll give you some equity uh, if you want to do it, and right. and and I liked him, and I liked the business, and I thought I could help, and those were the three. I can still remember that. You know, um, that was like more. That was almost twenty five years ago. I can still remember that. That's that's that was the decision, right? Do I like this business? It was selling fashion. There was some really positive energy around it. Yes, I like this business. Do I like my boss? Yeah, he was a really charismatic, smart guy who I kind of, you know, felt I wanted to to work with and wanted to help. And do I think I can help him? Yeah, I think I can help him. Yeah. And and those three questions, I always say, you know, sometimes I'll do fairly often I'll do talks with uh, people joining All Saints or or you know, newly qualified accountants. And sometimes I'll be asked, you know, how do you, how do you decide, you know, if and when to make a career change, you know, to make a move? And I'll say those are the three questions. I've not done it too often, but when I have, those are the three questions I ask myself. Do I like the business? Do I like my boss? You know, do I respect my boss? Uh, And do I think I can help? Um, And if the answer to all three is yes, that's what's triggered the move. I think that's really good advice for everybody, Um, not only when they're going to work for somebody else, but also when they're offering clients work as well, the the clients that they attract. I think they're great questions to ask themselves, definitely. Mm. So what led you to London and how did you land the job at All Saints? So the All Saints job, which was CFO originally, is the only job I've ever been offered by text message. So, so prior to All Saints, I was in Edinburgh. It's true. So I was in Edinburgh, and I was right. working as the CFO of a veterinary business, a really great veterinary business where right. I, I was kind of, the, the idea was I was taking the, the kind of retail as detail, multi-site experience as a CFO and helping this entrepreneur uh, who was a vet helping him apply those principles to a kind of multi-site veterinary 
model, you know, arguably quite a sleepy, it had been quite a sleepy profession from a commercial point of view. And this was, this was kind of the commercialization, you know, dynamic kind of kicking in. So I was doing that in Edinburgh, surrounded by, you know, dogs and cats and hamsters. And, and, um, with, with my fiance, who's now my wife, and a text message came through from the guy who was this guy who was the CEO of All Saints at the time, this was 2010. And he'd been the marketing director at USC when I was a CFO at USC. So we had this connection where we'd had, we'd, we'd been part of the management team that had kind of, um, helped USC flourish kind of 15 or 10 years earlier. So, so the text message comes through and it says, Pete, all Saints has taken over the world, you know, New York, LA, Paris, Berlin. Do you want to be our CFO? And, and my, Christina, my fiance and my wife grabbed my phone and replied, yes. And, and that was literally, that was literally, that's true. That was literally like, uh, how the All Saints journey without sounding a bit too pompous about it, how that kind of started. She knew it was an amazing fashion brand. I knew of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and for us as a couple, uh, you know, we were ambitious and, and we both knew instantly that this was our chance to kind of get to the big smoke, if you like, get to London and, yeah. you know, do I like the business? Yeah. An, an amazing brand. I knew Stephen well from working with them at All Saints and thought I could help. Right. So, so. You know, we packed our bags and jumped in the car, and that was kind of it. Off we went down to London uh, for All Saints, uh, and quite an exciting journey. Yeah, and and you know, when we got there, there was there was quite a lot. There was like probably a huge challenge, even bigger than or similar in scale to COVID, because we you know, arrived on the back of the global financial crisis. And all right, th there were sort of some really big things to kind of deal with. Uh, so it was a real kind of baptism of fire. And, and, you know, kind of all in, if you like, we'd moved from Scotland. So, so in a way, kind of just had to keep going. But that, you know, I guess the kind of, the corollary of that was that I was really, really uh, in with the bricks at All Saints because because the first the first twelve to eighteen months was really, really full on. But I loved the brand, and almost having had that made that move, yeah. there was a kind of like, you know, I didn't want to go back to Scotland with my tail between my legs, right? That that was definitely something yeah. in there, right? So there was a real determination to kind of come out the other side of all the challenges but in so doing the kind of indirect impact was kind of really falling in love with the with the brand and and just the the dna of it and the, and, and the business and you know and that's why i'm still still there and very i feel you know so happy that i've now got you know for almost five years now i've been the ceo which has been a real privilege it's fantastic it it's an, a brand that has incredible loyalty, doesn't it? Yes, and you know, for me, it's long before you know there was such open discussion about diversity and inclusion. I actually think the All Saints audience. The thing I love most about All Saints is the audience or the customer base, which I would describe as the most inclusive audience in fashion and I really mean that sincerely so that that really kind of drives me so we have all gender identities all lifestyles all ages all you know ethnicities in our audience we can see that but kind of so what lots of fashion brands have that but the the one thing that really differentiates the all saints audience over and above those other attributes is we also transcend income so, so, you know, very, very, very affluent people that can afford to, to shop, 
you know, luxury all day long, they will choose to to buy All Saints because they think it's cool. They, they, they think the product is really strong. They feel good when they're wearing it. But equally, um, people who shop in Zara, for example, most of the time for fashion, um, who are on, you know, average incomes, um, they will choose to wear All Saints when they can and, and they'll enjoy wearing it. And, and yeah. right across that whole income spectrum, there's a kind of acceptance that All Saints is kind of for everyone and it's cool to be wearing All Saints. And that's that's a really positive thing. And I, I don't, I can't think of, you know, another fashion brand, an apparel brand certainly that, that has that. Apple has it. So, you know, mm-hmm. everyone's allowed an iPhone. Doesn't matter, you know, what your income is, yeah. if you like. Uh, Nike has it, you know, and, and you know, yeah. Nike sneakers are not the most expensive, you know, trainers in the world, but very, very affluent people will choose to wear them very happily. And so will, you know, aspirational, uh, you know, people who who can't afford to, to wear more expensive uh, items. So, so... But within fashion itself, All Saints is the only brand that I really see that has that, and that defines the opportunity for me, if you like, as as a CEO. I, I've never thought of the brand like that at all, but now you say it out loud, you're absolutely right that people, like you say, with average incomes who who would normally shop at Zara, right up to the super rich, will buy All Saints, and that's 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 a really difficult positioning to achieve for any brand um you must have some really clever marketing people there so i mean the the interesting thing for me is you know i didn't create that right i didn't create all saints but that is that is part of the dna that 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 was kind of there and was apparent to me Having having been there for so long, and that's why I was delighted to get the chance to be CEO because I really saw that as the as the kind of opportunity, and and the this notion, you know, we I'm very careful with with you know the whole kind of marketing and positioning because it's almost like it's almost like if you say it out loud, you kind of burst the bubble a little bit. You know, I always say that, you know, we're not a retailer, we're in the business of, you know, not in the retail business, in the business of feelings. And and our, our purpose really is to just create good feelings for our audience. And it doesn't matter what age you are, what gender you are, you know, what your lifestyle is, you know, what shape or size you are, what you're, you know, who you voted for, how much money you earn you know, uh, what colour you are, none of those things matter, right? If you if you believe that putting on a piece of clothing is is a way that you can that can create good feelings, you, you feel a bit better about yourself and about people around you after you put it on than you did just before, then come on in, right? You know, come on into all saints and 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 that works internally as well as externally, so 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 that I really think that's a kind of really lovely, you know. I think if your values almost can kind of play externally and internally, I, I kind of think you're on to something. And and so so um, that's that's how we try and you know almost test our values. Is you know can we can we apply those to our customers, our stakeholders, as well as with our team. Um, and does all that hold together? And if it does, yeah. then I think there's some integrity to it, hopefully. Completely agree. And you've essentially, Peter, described one of our models in that your external brand promise has to also be the brand promise to your internal clients who are your team, your staff. And actually, the promise to your internal people is more important than the promise to the external people, your customers and your clients, because you have to get it right from the inside out. And and so many businesses do it from the outside in and it's the wrong way around. And I, and I think that's why you don't necessarily have to talk about it because 
it's it's in it's in the behavior and as you rightly say it's in the dna and you can only do that from the inside out i think that's fantastic yeah it's nice to hear that that sort of chimes with you and 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 the work that you're doing the the um i mean the name is fantastic all saints right so so when i'm when i'm talking with our team i always say yeah. off we are all saints right and 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 sometimes I'll add an all mm -hmm. saints is all of us. So this sort of idea that the brand is the sum of its people, and 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 the people, you know, we are we are all saints. All saints is all of us. This sort of relationship, right, that is evolving because we're not all, we're not you know I'm not going to be there forever. But there's there's something lovely about the name All Saints, which again nothing to do with me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's but it's a strong yeah. it's a strong you know, inclusive name. And when, you know, when, you know, when I was sitting down thinking, how do we position all this internally, to your point, before I even got to externally, yeah. the, the, this notion of, you know, we're going to look after each other, we're going to look after our suppliers, our customers, we're going to look after, uh, you know, our communities and our planet. This idea of being responsible was, was very, very clear in my head because our customer base is really quite broad that it almost becomes a duty, right? And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean. Uh, people talk about CRM strategies in business, you know, customer relationship management. And, and we've kind of twisted that in a different way at all states. So C is for cool. And how do you define cool? Well, uh, the, the most contentious thing I'm going to say to you today, probably, uh, Rebecca, is that, you know, I now consider myself to be cool, right? And, and what I mean by that is it's taken me a long time. Probably I was 45 before I was really kind of comfortable being me, right? And and I think a, a, a useful definition of cool is being comfortable in your own skin, not a kind of 1990s, yeah. you know, wild party, you know. Cool for me is a much more individual, personal kind of concept, you know, uh, now. And I think at all sense, we want to say, you know, it's about being cool, being comfortable in your own skin. It's about, so that's the C part of CRM. R is responsible, looking after each other, looking after customers, suppliers, community, planet. And M is for mass or many, if you like. And that's the, that's the kind of, you know, from Zara to Xenia in terms of the customer um, base that we attract. So, so Stella McCartney is an amazing brand very very cool very yeah. very responsible but you know not you know most zara customers cannot afford to wear stella mccartney right so so perhaps not the m piece so so you know the kind of coming together of the c and the r and the m is the sweet spot if you like that that we think we have at all saints and and you know we think that applies you know, in terms of our audience, the target market that we're that we're going after, but we also think that's a really useful way of bringing together the team, you know, within the business as well to to align around to align around those kind of attributes, if you like. Absolutely. And how have you integrated a new brand into the family? Because that's that's you know quite a tall order to bring on something else when you've got such a beautiful culture going there so they say that necessity is the mother of invention right so so indeed we had just my first full financial year as ceo ended on the 31st of january 2020 we got off to a good start we at that that financial year we had the best sales and ebitda all saints had ever had in its history sort of 25 year history at the time and so off to a good start. And I remember sitting with our chairman beginning of March 2020 saying, 
off to a good start. You know, here's the plan for the year ahead. And then, of course, three weeks later, the whole business worldwide was shut down. You know, we're in something like 20 countries. And um, and so winning at that point wasn't about wasn't about growing. Winning became surviving. You know, defining the win was, yeah. was to say to the team, right, listen, guys, the same team that's just delivered our best year in our history is going to be the team that gets us through the biggest challenge in our history, right? And, and this COVID thing, we don't know much about it. But the first thing to do is just accept, accept it. You know, I remember like yeah. trying to make sure there wasn't kind of energy wasted on being angry, right? You know, like we've got to accept this, right? And let's get that acceptance piece out of the way quickly. And then let's knuckle down into looking after each other, looking after our customers. So what was really nice was those values, they were they were the same values that created the best performance, but they also really helped us come through COVID. Now as part of as part of the COVID challenge, we had big liquidity challenges as you might expect. And, you know, speaking to our chairman saying, have you got, you know, have you got any funds, backup funds that might be available cash? Because I think we might need it, right? And, and you know, but because of the way the world was and because our ownership is focused on consumer-facing businesses, you know, all, all investments were kind of in the same boat. So it wasn't easy for our owners to readily say, yep, yeah, no problem, here's some cash. But what... Yeah. What they did have was another brand, John Vervetos, which hadn't had its best year ever before COVID. So unfortunately, John Vervetos was was going into Chapter 11. It went into bankruptcy in New York. Oh, really? But our owner said, if you think you can turn it around and bring it out of bankruptcy, we will support you to do that. And when I say necessity is the mother of invention, literally... This was a very convoluted way <laughs> to potentially being able to get some surplus assets and cash that we could that that could help restore the strength of the All Saints balance sheet. And it was kind of what was convoluted. It was kind of the only way, right? So it was like one of those like mazes that we had to kind of work through. And so and you know, kind of in the heat of battle, if you like. And knowing, again, I did know the John Vervetos brand. I did like it, you know, a really strong brand. Same ownership. So I knew I knew my boss, uh, great, great guy, my chairman, very supportive. And again, I thought I could help because I'd spent some time in John Vervetos previously um, when I'd been in uh, New York doing business for All Saints over the years. So I had a sense of where the challenges were in that business model and what I thought, you know, we needed to do to kind of fix that. So if I hadn't had those things, it, it, it would have been kind of, you know, not a smart thing to do. But having had a sense of what needed to be done and how that could lead to, you know, a net improvement in the financial position of, of what we were grappling with, that's what, that's what led us to do that. And it was really challenging. It was really interesting because I couldn't get to New York, you know, lockdown, travel no. bans, all of this, right? So it was actually yeah. something like 18 months after I started, you know, myself and the team at All Saints. And it was it was just myself initially because I didn't want to distract anyone else at All Saints. They would all have probably thought I was bonkers, yeah. right? So so I wanted to kind of suss it out and, and sort of do the initial stuff myself in terms of the setup i thought that was the right thing to do rather than rather than burden the team at all saints who we were we were we were very stretched as you can imagine just day by day dealing yeah. with the covid challenges on all saints so i was doing a lot of kind of zoom calls with the john veritas team in new york and they were kind of sussing me out they hadn't met me before you know and and there was a kind of almost like a courtship over zoom yeah and absolutely and they they you know they took a, a kind of leap of faith because they'd seen 
a few, they'd had something like five or six CEOs over the previous seven or eight years. So they probably thought, here's another one, right? And, and, but, but we came together with Zoom and, and we turned it around. So, you know, we've just had January year end. All Saints is their new best ever year, and, and John Vervetos has also had, you know, best ever year. So, so yeah, it's been it's been hard, but but you know we've come through it as a team, and and I'm uh, really really proud of what we've achieved together. That's amazing. Yeah, quite right. C- congratulations to you and your team. That is some major achievement. Where, where next, Peter? What what happens next in the it's, in the life of career of, of Peter? It's a very good question, and and interesting. We're talking with my team, my team closest to me in London, All Saints, my senior team. Just in the last few weeks, this really is the first time in more than three years since we've had a chance to sort of lift our heads up a little bit and not just think about next week, next month, mm. next season, but really properly think about putting some roots down, if you like, for next year, you know, so making some, I mean, that, that yeah, <laughs> it sounds a bit silly saying long term when I mean, all I really mean is 2024, right? But the way the world has been, you know, it has been kind of, managing by day almost during covid or not almost that's what it was totally. and and then it was you know don't yeah. do anything stupid let's get through this month this season you know it's been very much like that so it's it's a it's a bit of a luxury or refreshing i would say to now be able to really think about making plans for for the for next year rather than this year and and because some things take a bit of organizing, right? And and so I'm enjoying this feeling of, you know, we've got a pop up store on Fifth Avenue right now with All Saints, and I'm kind of thinking it's going it's going pretty well. So I'm thinking, right, we should have a permanent store on Fifth Avenue, right? But that's not the kind of thing that just appears around the corner. That takes a bit of planning. So so things like that. Um, We've got some time now to really hopefully um, organize. And it sounds, it perhaps sounds a little bit glib, but I do mean it. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of almost 13 years into being with All Sense, almost five years into being CEO. But it sounds like, and this sounds maybe a bit strange, but I feel like it's just the end of the beginning now. <laughs> and, 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 it really is, you know, this audience, this brand has, and John Vervetos sort of compliments All Saints. It's it's arguably, in, in the way that I say All Saints is the most inclusive brand, John Vervetos, in, in kind of a, in a very different way, is almost like the most exclusive brand. It's a, it's a, it's a luxury, price-pointed menswear only kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's, very different from all saints uh, in terms of who its audience is okay but but you could believe it's like a a cousin uh, of all saints because of the dna of the product okay. you know so there is a kind of complementary piece but it's different right and you know this idea of a group of brands there's a third brand on its way as i speak to you now uh, rebecca can't quite reveal Okay. Which brand it is yet? But uh, uh, another, another, you know, amazing brand with great potential. So, so in terms of what's next, I guess this idea of of having a group of brands, um, with all saints, certainly the kind of mothership, if you like, yeah. you know, front and center but a few other brands that are complementary around that. And the thing that's really driving me is a belief that, and I've been thinking over recent months about how best to sort of summarise this, and I think the way I would say it is a belief that values create value. Uh, And and so, you know, 
I am determined to, to kind of show the investor community, if you like, other stakeholders, you know, my team believe it anyway, which is lovely. Yeah. But but just to just to show that if you have a strong set of values, you know, the numbers are the outputs, right? The numbers are not the inputs. And if if you if you build your you know, if you've got a great a great brand with great talent and you're aligned on these values that, that work externally and internally, you know, I think we can show that that's how you make money, if you like, and create shareholder totally. value. And and so it, they're not two separate totally. things. You know, we've got to create, you know, returns for shareholders. Oh, and by the way, over here, we've got to be responsible and look after the planet. What I'm sort of determined to prove and what's driving me is that by being responsible, you know, it's because we're being responsible. That's That's why, that's how we're going to create value for our stakeholders and 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 i think there's going to be an opportunity to kind of break through with that message in the coming years you know there's a there's a lot of kind of spinning within the fashion industry right now it's it's right. an industry which arguably has quite a negative reputation with lots of people who perhaps are yeah. not who are not living in the industry day in day out and I, I do think and I do hope that All Saints will be the brand, as I say, with a few other lovely brands in the portfolio that, that can kind of come through with a positive message and, and show that this is how you do fashion in the 21st century and this is how yeah. you can do it in a way that's responsible, that creates good feelings for all stakeholders. Peter, this is how you do business. This is yeah. what we embed into the businesses that we work with is, is that if you're aligned with a clear set of values, then the business becomes more sustainable and more valuable. And actually, we work with SMEs generally, uh, which means you get a better exit, whether that's to employees or whether it's to your family members or whether it's an external sale. But actually, it, it's you're right it it's integrated it's not these two are separate without building those core values and core behaviors from the inside out you actually don't have a business that's worth as much um and you're right the numbers are the output but so many businesses start with the numbers and it's the wrong way around so it's not just the fashion industry it's all business which is amazing that's great we should uh, we should just both be out there well you're banging the drum i know you are and i'm banging the drum um and and there it also makes businesses a nicer place to work for everybody apart from anything else yeah i think again you know we're all kind of the sum of our parts right of all the influences in our lives and all this you know you know sometimes you know, just as you say, serendipity or think different things that have happened, and and I remember, you know, so I'm colorblind, right? For example, so like, um, which I I often joke about because how can you be running fashion brands and be colorblind, right? But but it but but I sort of I sort of use this to sort of demonstrate the point that you have, you know, it's about a team bringing what you know bringing their own contribution to the party, if you like. And 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 even though I've got a finance background, which is very helpful for sure, you know, I remember when I was working in corporate finance, to your point that you just made a minute ago, you know, the numbers of the outputs that we were talking about, I used to sit as the kind of the, the young, you know, the junior in the corporate finance team at Arthur Anderson. My job, lots of business plans would be sent in lots of management teams looking for investment. And my job would be to sit and read through and kind of filter. Uh, in, in the days before, you know, lots of technology to kind of help do this stuff, literally sit and read these plans and think, okay, this one's got something to it. I'll, I'll show this to the manager or the partner. This one, not so much, right? And And what I always remember thinking was the best business plans I knew I knew that they were going to work before I saw the numbers. The way the way business plans are normally written, 
you know, there's different chapters and there'll be some executive summary at the start. There'll be, but there'll be a section towards the end, which is all the financials. And if, if I hadn't, if I wasn't convinced before I turned that page into the financials, then it wasn't, it wasn't a plan that I put forward. So you have to capture, it's an emotive thing. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. I really believe that you have yeah. to capture, you have to hook people first with what it's all about, you know, what are you trying to do, you know, is the team the right team to do it, you know, all of those things, What what's your market, all of that stuff. The numbers are the outputs, right? And, and it's only if you have all those yeah. other things in place. And to be able to do that, you've got to be able to, you know, you can't do anything on your own. So what is your what is your basis yeah. for being able to to recruit and retain the talent that you need to help you do it? And if it's not if it's not your values, Absolutely. I'm not sure I'm not sure what it is. You know, what can it be, right? So exactly. So, so yeah, I suppose exactly. I'm just saying that because it, it it's just always been like that, very clear to me like that in my head, right? That that and that's where I do go back to my parents and my upbringing and all of that stuff, right? It's just a. I think some people think of business as some sort of separate, you know, universe, right? And and you sort of you wear a different persona or whatever, you know. But at the end of the day, it's about people, and it's about, you know, I always talk about a one to one connection. Even though we've got we've got two thousand plus employees, and you know, a million plus in our customer database and all of this stuff. Okay, that's the kind of business language talking. Forget all that, right? How do we how do we make everything feel like it's a one to one, no matter how big we are? Because if we had just okay. one shop, right? If we had just one shop, if I had just one shop, I would know the names of the people who work for me. I would know what personal challenges yeah. perhaps they've got going on and stuff that they're dealing with. I would know what personal good things are going on that are happening for them. I'd know my customers, right? You know, do you see what I'm saying? Like, and 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 it's it's yeah. it's trying not to lose that as you scale in business. It's trying to actually remember that the whole time that you know. And you're talking about SMEs. For me, that's how that's how you can sort of as you scale try and try and differentiate yourself by holding on to some of those amazing principles that SMEs just totally understand like you know all day long that sometimes as you get bigger you lose sight of it so uh, last question peter because you're a very busy man um i normally ask about the character and personality of the business but i feel you've described that beautifully so i'm going to ask you a slightly different question Mm. if you were to describe the character or personality of your ceo ship your leadership, how would you describe it? Of of mine or in general? Yeah, of, of yours and, a, and of the CEO and leadership yeah. that you admire. What kind of characters yeah. or personality traits are in there? So so what I, what I would sort of blurt out, you know, as the kind of reflex response and it's because it's what I really feel is you have to be you, right? And I, I kind of, I, yeah. I don't mean that to sound cheesy, but but when I when I first joined All Saints and global financial crisis, big challenges, I actually ended up being interim CEO, you know, 10, 11 years ago. And I used to joke at the time, I wouldn't introduce myself as the interim CEO. I would introduce myself as the acting CEO. and and um. And I would I would sort of make this joke about, you know, whenever something came across my desk, I'd sit and say, What would a real CEO do in this situation? Right. Um, so right. I was kind of act, I was kind of acting, right? You know, and it was almost like I'm reaching for a book, you know, in my mind, you know, there's an answer somewhere, I can find an answer here as to what to do, right? And it and it became about, you know, this sort of CEO persona almost a bit too much, right? And and sort of fast forward five or six years to when I when I became CEO 
as as the as the job as opposed to just you know in, on an interim basis. I really felt I had more confidence then that it was you know what what I could bring to it was me right, and I don't mean that to sound like some kind of ego thing, but but what I'm saying is, if your team, you know, who knew they knew me well. Like a lot of the team had been with me since I joined. Many have still, you know, been with the brand since before I joined. They're still with us now. If they'd seen me sort of flip and become this totally different kind of persona in the business, they wouldn't have had it, right? They wouldn't have bought it. And and so, kind of realizing that step one is you've got to be you, because if if your team don't don't have that almost confidence that that you are being you it's not going to work i really i really believe that so it's it's not i don't think so i guess what i'm trying to say rebecca is there are many many di- and i think this is a positive there are many many different types of ceo you know you know in the planet i i i meet lots of amazing you know positive people you know, i'm very fortunate now that i get to meet more and more people who are leading businesses in different parts of the world, and 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 the one thing when you get that feeling that some you know someone's kind of being themselves, and and not sort of thinking what are they doing over there? We need to be more like that, or what you know you can learn from others, but I think I think it has to be done through your own your own particular experience. Otherwise, it just doesn't feel horrible word but it doesn't feel authentic right so that you know so i think be yourself is is kind of point number one and then then i think there is open your eyes to learning and being stimulated and finding inspiration in all sorts of strange places so a lot of the ideas and actually the strategies the ideas sort of become strategies and the kind of metaphors and the hooks and things that I'll use to try and illustrate those points to the team, I kind of find them because I'm sort of open and scanning almost and soaking stuff up or trying to soak stuff up in all sorts of strange, again, not thinking just business, yeah, but, but more just thinking back to one-to-one and yeah. life and experience and where can I sort of pick up parallels so that sort of curiosity piece and just being open, I think, is is the other thing. So so be you, but don't but don't be you as in lock yourself in a cupboard and and you know and think that you've got all the answers. You know, be be open and curious and and kind of and get a, there's a lovely energy to be found when you can just let amazing things that you see going on just kind of wash over you and you can kind of soak them up and and kind of process them and think yeah i can i can maybe use that in the business i love that feeling when 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 that happens brilliant perfect place to end thank you so much peter i really appreciate your time because i know you're incredibly busy and people are going to get so much value out of this today thank you so much oh a, a pleasure and thank you the Entrepreneurial Journey Podcast. We're talking business and building a culture that's kick ass. Where we make it happen, grab your seat, let's have.